So hi, hi everyone. We'll start. Um, can everyone hear me? Hello. <laughs> So hi, hi everyone. Hello, and um, there's seats up the front. Hello and welcome to everyone here um, at the Chow Chow Wing Museum at the University of Sydney, and also to our live stream audience to celebrate the announcement of the 2021 winner of the Helen Ann Bell Poetry Bequest Award for an unpublished manuscript by a woman poet which is being hosted by the Department of English. I'm Beth Yap, the coordinator of creative writing and will be your MC tonight. Today, we're also celebrating the stunning shortlist of seven poets and the announcement of a special School of Literature, Art and Media Poetry Award 2021 in recognition of the runner up of the Helen Ann Bell Award. We extend a very warm welcome to our honored guests, the shortlisted poets, the judges, our university's vice chancellor, Professor Mark Scott, and other university um, representatives, and also everyone behind the scenes who has helped to pull this event together at somewhat short notice. The first part of the evening will include a few words from our head of school, uh, School of Literature, Art and Media, Associate Professor Ian Maxwell, a judge of the Helen Ann Bell um, Poetry Bequest Award this year, Associate Professor Kate Lilly, the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences Interim Dean, Professor Lisa Adkins, who will award certificates to our shortlisted poets who are here, followed by the announcement of the winners by the Vice Chancellor. After a short break, we'll have readings by the poets at about 6.30, introduced by a few words from our Chair of the Department of English, Dr. Hugh Griffiths. This is our first public event at the university after the lockdown in Sydney. And what a wonderful way to celebrate the achievements of the poets who put together and submitted their book length manuscripts during this challenging year. I'd like to remind everyone um, here in person that public health orders are in place for, for us. Um, and we should keep our masks on at all times when indoors, um, exceptions being when up here speaking or during the break when taking refreshments, keeping to the 1.5 meters um, distance. And without further ado, I'd like to invite, invite um, Rowena Walsh from the Metropolitan Aboriginal Land Council uh, to welcome us to country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so good evening. As stated, my name is Rowena Welsh Jarrett. I would like to start by acknowledging any elders present here today, our elders past and also our ancestors. I would also like to acknowledge any Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islanders brothers and sisters present here today. I am a Darawal Gumbengi woman born on Gadigal land with Gadigal, Bidjigal, Wangal, Gwigal, among other Sydney clan bloodline links. My maternal grandmother is from the Timbri family of La Perouse. I come from an unbroken line of Kuris born here in Sydney. As I just stated, my people also were from other parts of Sydney, but we settled around Lapa with the establishment of the reserve and various blacks camps after the impact of invasion and colonization, introduced disease and ongoing conflict, saw our population dramatically drop and reduced our access to our traditional lands. Therefore, my old people's way of life changed. My people were proud fishermen and shell workers. We would move about following fishing seasons in this very harbour and the surrounding rivers from as far south as Wreck Bay, as far north as the Hawkesbury River. My family still proudly live on country, out at La Perouse, in Redfern and surrounding areas. Traditionally, many nations often gathered around the Sydney Basin area because of its great cultural significance and to ensure that our cultural knowledges, practices and laws were passed on. Often moving around among our Sydney people and surrounding mobs areas, we would follow customs such as being welcomed onto country by neighbouring nations 
and or nations whose country we would pass through for reasons such as ceremony, marriage and trade. This traditional custom was carried out to acknowledge ancestors, people of the land past and present, acknowledge their customs and their law and respectfully adhere to those customs and laws whilst on country. In turn, this ensured your safe passage through country and enabled you to enjoy the abundance of foods, medicines and waters from this country whilst visiting and or passing through. I myself was raised from a very young age, hearing, seeing these customs, various travel lines, marriage lines, ancestral lines, song lines. My people, especially our women, depict this area, especially the Harbour Bridge in our shell work art. It's representative of our country and our unbroken and continued connection to it. I myself was taught how to fish, gather shellfish and small animals and use native plants for medicinal weaving and food purposes. I was taken onto country, two sites of high cultural significance in Sydney and surrounding areas during holidays and on weekends. This sparked in me a great amount of pride and a sense of self in my culture and my land. I then from the age of 19 was employed as a trainee cultural heritage officer with the Sydney Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, giving me the opportunity to care for country, record our sites of significance in hopes that they would be reserved and protected under the guidance of our elders from local communities. For me, the moment that sticks with me was my participation in a repatriation ceremony of my ancestral remains after they had been taken in the name of science from this very university and institutions abroad. We returned our ancestors to Gemme Bay National Park near Lapa Reserve. We prepared the remains and buried them in accordance to our traditional custom. It was an open ceremony and the wider community were able to attend and take part in this ceremony. The reason this particular experience stuck with me is because it embedded in me the need for understanding, the need for our history to be told, and most of all, the continuation of our culture and our customs, the culture and the customs of this very land. So it is with these experiences, the knowledge passed down to me, the bloodlines within me, and on behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, that I'm honored to welcome you to country. I welcome you to this country, shared country of the Gadigal and Wongo, of the Wongo people, the land of the Gadigal and Wongo since time began, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome. Thank you, Alina. Um, and now I'd like to invite um, the head of school of the uh, School of Literature, Art and Media to say a few words, uh, prof Associate Professor Ian Maxwell. Thank you. Wow, real people. I just have to remind myself, it's just like a Zoom meeting. They're, they're not really here, that's, that's okay. Uh, thank you so much for that extraordinary welcome. Th thank you so much. Uh, I, I, just prepared a, a few short words, not wanting to miss an opportunity to, to speak. It is wonderful to be here with other human beings in, in this place, in this rather extraordinary place. Uh, this building, uh, for some reason, I feel inordinately proud that we have such a building on this campus. Um, picking up what was just said, my understanding, having been taught by um, Jackie Troy and others on the campus, is that where we are standing was referred to as the kangaroo grounds. So this wasn't um, land that was owned by a particular people. It was an in-between place. And in fact, down here at the water, it was a, a meeting place. It's where salt water meet, meets fresh water. So this is a place of mediation and meeting. Uh, kangaroo grounds, this is a hunting ground. Kangaroos were apparently driven up this hill to a stand of trees where the quadrangle stands, where there was thick growth, and I mean, this is a trigger warning. Um, apparently the, the process was to spear kangaroos through their chests and the spear would entangle them in the trees. Um, the trees that were felled to provide some of the wood for the quadrangle building. Um, and as Jackie says, the, the mortar holding the stones together in the quadrangle building came from middens you know, so this building, as much as it looks, that building up the hill, as much as it looks like a, a dream of Oxbridge, uh, Jackie says is a blackfella building 
gives me a little, little shiver to think that. Um, and now, of course, this building is, is the face of the university turned to the city. And I think that's very, very important. Um, it's a university facing the global city immediately adjacent to it. And I think it's wonderful that the building that does that is a cultural institution. Um, so worlds continue to meet in this place. And I think the very eclectic nature of the collection here embodies that as well. If you get a chance to walk around, it's curated in the most extraordinary way with natural history, ethnographic, classical, and the paintings from the extraordinary power bequest. So I'm delighted that we meet here tonight in this first event to talk about poetry, to celebrate poetry, to celebrate words, telling stories, finding those connections between ourselves, the things that we have missed so much in the last two years as we've been at home watching Netflix. And of course that pales after a little while. And what I hope, my gamble, my fervent wish is that people will come out of that experience with, a, with an appetite, not just to go to a horse race or a football game, but to participate in culture. And that we in this university and the school that we're part of should be leaders in that context. Um, I do speak as the, the um, interim head of the School of Literature, Art and Media. We're very excited in, in that area at the moment because pending the outcome of some changes which we're in the middle of, we do have the chance next year to reboot the school as a school of, and there will be debates about the name because that's the nature of the gig, uh, something like a school of arts and communication. Don't come at me yet, we'll have that debate. But in, in this new school, we will have two, of, two world-class departments of English and art history, an extraordinary art school, an art college on campus in an extraordinary refitted building, which is like a little pressure cooker of art. And we have a powerhouse media and communications department. We have an emerging capacity in film studies. We have theater and performance studies. And my ambition for this new school, and in so much as I'm entitled to have an ambition, is that this school helps to establish and maintain and build the reputation of this university, not just as a site of research excellence and teaching excellence, but as a cultural institution for the city. And that we are actually, we take our place as cultural leaders, creating the cultural agents of the future, which should be our mission. Creative writing sits amongst that picture. And I would say, that creative writing in some ways sits at the kind of interstices of all those disciplines. It's a creative practice embedded within an English department, embedded within values of scholarly excellence and teaching, but it, it moves between these kind of intensities that constitute the school. So that's, I, I'm just thrilled, I've spoken too long, but I just, as I said, I want to take the opportunity to present that, that vision. I am excited that I get to briefly introduce you to the judges for tonight. So the first judge is uh, Kate Lilly, who's well known to, to many of us here. Uh, Kate has apparently judged this prize several times. So uh, three times, um, three or four. <laughs> um, yes, I've got the cheat sheet here. I think it's three. Um, taught in the Department of English for 30 years, and I remember you as an under, right, right then, yes. Uh, and he's of course one of Australia's uh, foremost contemporary poets, whose recent book, Tilt, is credited with shifting the landscape of Australian poetry because, and I'm quoting here from I think the Sydney Review of Books, because it works on things and ideas that are being publicly discussed right now and that affect the social and personal lives of most people. Things like gender, sexuality, violence, and power. Pam Brown is the second judge, uh, has also um, been on the panel for several iterations um, and has been a major contributor to experimental traditions in Australian poetry, has written over 20 books. We'd like to get hold of some of that non-traditional research outcome action um, and has written for 
um, performance as well as and theatre and visual media, um, and has been a contributing editor for journals such as Overland and Jacket. Um, again, the Sydney Review of Books wrote a virtuoso of the local. Her poems rarely leave whatever street she's on. They are as mobile and as mutable as daily life. Melinda Bufton is a, sorry, is a Melbourne-based poet, poet and reviewer, and her work has appeared in a number of publications from Cordite, Southerly, Axon and Rabbit, and she has been anthologized in contemporary Australian feminist poetry, contemporary Australian poetry, and has written two previous collections. In 2019, Melinda was awarded the Helen Ann Bell Poetry Bequest Award for her manuscript Moxie, a brilliant achievement and intrinsically feminist work. I think that's me done. I hand back to Beth for the next part. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. And I'll just invite Kate up here to give the judges report um, for this year's award. Thank you, Beth, and thank you, Ian. Um, I too pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, um, never ceded. And seems especially appropriate that uh, we're here to celebrate poetry and women and Australian creative labor uh, in this place. And uh, I want to begin just by thanking as well my fellow judges. Uh, as Ian said, Pam and I have judged this award for the last three times. It's only been awarded four times. And um, um, we, you know, we've got it down. Um, <laughs> and, and I think we depend on each other. And then for the last two times, we've been very lucky and grateful to have the previous year's winner. Um, so in this case, Melinda Bufton, um, last year, Fiona Heil, to judge it with us. Um, and we are, uh, in this iteration and in every other iteration there's been two, we are a very uh, congenial group, which is very important when you're, or very nice anyway, when you're judging, you know, and believe me, doesn't always happen. Uh, so it's one of the things when you are reading, as we have read this time, 319 manuscripts submitted by Australian women poets, which is in itself an incredible testimony to the energy um, being invested in this form. Um, and it's part of that is that this award is not only so generous, it is the most generous award um, in the country. Uh, and it's also free to enter, also extremely unusual. Um, so no one is, no one who qualifies otherwise, who's eligible otherwise is barred from entering. Um, every manuscript is at least 55 pages. Uh, so as you can see, we, we really read a lot of poems. Um, <laughs> And um, I think it's, it's absolutely true. I say this with absolute sincerity. We were bowled over, I mean, both by the quantity of work submitted, but also by how good so much of it was. Um, and this shortlist, you know, we're here to honor the shortlist and of course the winners today, but um, it's extraordinarily good. And, um, you know, we certainly admired each of your manuscripts very much. And, um, you know, we have to choose, but it's very difficult to do that. And it was very difficult even to come up with the shortlist and why we um, went to seven in the shortlist. So I'm going to read you quickly our, uh, the judges co-authored uh, commendations. And in each of those, very short encapsulations uh, labored over by us. Um, you'll hear fragments of the poet's work and, and I hope that um, you are all okay. You, the poets are okay with uh, how we did that. I hope um, you know, our tribute is sincere and I hope you, you know, that comes across. Uh, and you know, to the many, many poets listening on Zoom, uh, 
um, uh, small prizes like this and small press publishing, which is tied to this prize, um, an intrinsic part of it. That is the lifeblood of Australian poetry. I mean, I guess we'd all write poetry whether we could publish it or not. I don't know. Um, but it, it, is, it is difficult to publish poetry in this country, to publish books and to keep publishing books. Um, you would be very surprised to know how difficult it is, I think. Um, and on what a shoestring it proceeds. And the best thing you can do uh, for Australian poetry is buy small press books and support uh, our work and the work of all those who um, publish it. Usually it's the same people, or <laughs> well, some of the same people. All right, so in alphabetical order, um, Michelle Kale, her manuscript called Dark, Moving Through Cultures and Landscapes of Diasporic Unmaking. Dark is viscerally moving, urgent, panoramically ambitious. These compelling poems center the experience of a brown-skinned woman with skeptical intelligence and intensity. What my dark skin has taught me is not to trust white words. Kale addresses Australia's violent, racist colonial history in its worldwide entanglements, melding private mourning with public accountability in order to stake out a transformatively wild language, ethics and politics with a tongue that pushes and probes our history's darkest cavities. Those are Michelle's words, those last words. Joan Fleming, Dirt. Writing and thinking through the place of a white visitor on indigenous land, her phrase. Fleming's project is an experiment in freshly negotiated meaning and text making with explicit permission. Quote, it has been with the generosity, trust and willingness of my Walpuri friends and teachers that the poems in this book have been allowed and enabled to come into being, unquote. The resulting work draws the reader into these vital questions of what she calls lifelong responsibility and emergent possibility. Quote, if it is written down, what then? Unquote. Janine Lean. Sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, the, the Indigenous word here. Gawamara Gathering. A powerhouse, sorry, I meant to ask you beforehand. A powerhouse of vivid imagery, language and story Gawamara Gathering is a work of personal and collective history. Through eloquent resistance, custodianship and witnessing, Lean offers a poetic push towards healing. This is her, restore, regenerate, remember. Wake up every day stronger than all our traumas. Unpacking the manifold meanings of gathering and country before nation, Lean both confronts what she calls the white trinity of genocide capitalism, colonialism, Christianity, and pays homage to the strength of, quote, black women gatherers for all times and the immemorial endurance of, quote, what can never be stolen. Claire Miranda Roberts, Kangaroo Paw. In love with restraint and paradoxes of scale, the largest eucalypts have the smallest flowers, she writes. These minimalist phenomenological lyrics in the spirit of Dickinson and Nidecker revere their interstices, enigmas and openings, the poem between iris and the iris image are packed with the aerial ferns that bud. Using the page slash book as sensorium and laboratory to conjure life below life, thinking about living, Roberts explores the poetic interface and inflorescence of subjectivity, language and quote, if I stay long enough, I may become everything around me. Emma Symington, Peculiar Times. Start with a quote from her. The volcano drags a burnt orange Toyota Hilux up a hill, up a hill, Jack and fucking Jill. Would you like to rotate your photograph? Peculiar Times, great lines. But Peculiar Times delivers a blast of speculative and fantastic tableaus, infectious in its energy and excess an exuberant queer trans disabled memoir of apocalyptic end times. This is poetry as complex event, the old little girl more than her penis. Aligned with street photography and ready maids, peculiar times is peculiar in all the best ways, uncommon, offbeat, inimitable. 
Ella Skilbeck Porter. These are different waters. Conceptual, droll, and formally experimental. These are different waters, disposes its wide ranging materials into an elegant two part structure, inflatable pool and the substantial visual sequence, concrete pool. Skilbeck Porter dares to devise her own weird syntax of hallucinatory profusion, a through composed ink spell of restless post Steinian parataxis, algal bloom, lacing quotation marks. Decisive and yet dreamy, its poetic bricolage, a stratosphere of shifting surfaces, resists closure and passes the baton. The end of my swim, the beginning of yours. Emily Stewart, Running Time. A fine-tuned book-length assemblage of dispersed cerebral offcuts, virtuosically inventing the shape of a mood. Nimble and light, precise and seemingly casual. Quote, following some line of live consciousness, inner and outer, what's around. Amid doubt, shame, need, fear, there is courage and insouciance, the subtle pleasure of stretching meaning into a variety of imaginative spaces that open up the limits of conventional language and syntax. Condensed sharp pops of resonant fragments create their own fresh textures and juxtapositions. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. So wonderful to hear um, those snippets of poems. And now I'd like to invite um, Professor Lisa Adkins up to say a few words, um, the interim dean of um, FAS, to say a few words and um, award the certificates to the shortlist. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, and I agree with Ian and Beth's sentiments that it feels extraordinary to be back on campus and having an event in real life. I think this is Faz's first event since the lockdown, so it feels wonderful. And it's my absolute pleasure this evening to participate in celebrating this award that attracts such large engagement with practice, practicing poets in the wider literary community. This year, as Kate noted, there were a phenomenal 309 en entries. As the home of the arts and humanities at the University of Sydney, the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences is completely committed to supporting and ensuring excellence at all levels. Our gifts and bequests help us to pursue this mission in partnership with our communities. The Helen Ann Bell Poetry Bequest and the School of Literature, Art and Media Poetry Award 2021 could not be better examples of when this works well, with the Department of English partnering with the Australian literary community, both writers and readers, to promote and celebrate creativity and innovation in the field of poetry. As Kate noted, we have an absolutely stellar shortlist of poets for the award today. And with such a large number of entries, I can only just imagine what the challenge of shortlist shortlisting must have been. To be shortlisted from such an extensive field is an honor in itself. And I'm delighted that we can recognize that honor here this evening. The shortlist recognizes individual achievements and pays tribute to the vibrancy of the Aust Australian poetry community today. While there is only one winner of the Helen Ann Bell Award and of the SLAM Poetry Award, we also celebrate here tonight that larger community, a community of practice that ensures that the arts and humanities remain engaged and alive to the changing world around us. So our shortlisted um, poets, first uh, in alphabetical order, Michelle Kale was born in Kenya and lived in London before immigrating with her family to Australia. She writes poetry and fiction and studied medicine at Sydney University. 
Her prizes include the Val Vallis Award, the 2020 Red Room Poetry Fellowship, and the New South Wales Premier's Literary Award for New Writing for Letter to Pessoa. Her novel, Daisy and Wolf, is forthcoming with Hachette in 2022. We invite Michelle to come up and... Um, yes. <laughs> we have flowers and we have a certificate for you. <laughs> Our second shortlisted poet is Joan Fleming, the author of two collections of poetry from Victoria University Press, and she sits on the programming committee for the Una Muno Authors Series in Madrid and the Catastrophes Reading Series in Melbourne. Her third book, Song of Less, a verse novel exploring a ritual taboo, uh, exploring ritual taboo and the limits of love, language, and individualism in the ruins of ecological collapse, is forthcoming in January 2022 with Cordite Books. Congratulations, Janice. Next is Janine Lane, a Wiradjuri poet, writer, and academic from the Murrumbidgee. Her essays and poems have been widely published. Janine teaches creative writing at the University of Melbourne. Congratulations, Janine. Our next shortlisted poet is Claire Miranda Roberts, and she's um, joining us uh, on Zoom uh, from Zoom World. Her poetry has recently appeared in Westerly Magazine, Communion and Text, and her poem, Ars Poetica, was shortlisted for the Oxford Brooks International Poetry Competition 2020. And her poem, Bangster, came second in the Martha Richardson Memorial Poetry Prize 2020. She also translates poetry, and her translation of Christina Campo's poem, Brief Quatrain, was commended in the 2021 Stephen Spender Prize. So we have to virtually send you um, your bouquet of flowers and certificate, Claire. Congratulations. <laughs> Emma Skimmington is also joining us uh, via Zoom. Um, she is a writer residing on the Yagambe uh, country. She's a proud transgender and queer woman who also has a learning disability. Emma was a finalist in the 2020-2021 edition of the Tennessee Williams and New Orleans Literary Festival Poetry Contest. She's published in The Moth Magazine and Australian Poetry Journal, among others. Congratulations, Emma. Also sending you virtual, a virtual bouquet and certificate. Ella Skilbeck Porter is a poet and PhD candidate in French studies at the University of Melbourne. In 2018, she was a hot desk fellow at the Wheeler Center. And in 2020, she was awarded the H.B. Higgins Scholarship for the study of poetry. Her work has been published in various journals, including Cordite, Poetry Review, Rabbit Poetry Journal, and Authorless. Congratulations.
Our last um, shortlisted poet is um, Emily Stewart, who lives and works on Wongal land. She's the author of numerous chapbooks, including Like and The Internet Blue. Her debut collection, Knox by Vagabond Press, um, won the inaugural Noel Rowe Poetry Award. Emma's writing is frequently published in outlets, including Running Dog, Real Time, Overland, and the Saturday Paper. She was formerly the poetry editor of Giramondo and is, pub is currently completing a creative doctorate at the Writing and Society Research Center. Congratulations, Emily. <laughs> And now I'm very happy to um, invite um, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Mark Scott, to say a few words and announce the winners. Well, thanks so much, Beth, and ladies and gentlemen. Wonderful to be with you tonight. And I also want to acknowledge traditional owners, the Gadigal people of your nation, and pay my respect to elders past and present. Um, I think this might be the first event we've had at the university since we've uh, just started opening up after the COVID lockdown. And this is my first event with real people as vice chancellor of the university. I was appointed a little over three months ago. We've done a lot of Zooming since then, but it's wonderful to see real people and it's wonderful for the first event uh, to be an event about poetry. My next event is about rugby, which shows the diverse community we have here at the University of Sydney, but I'm glad the poets, we start with the poets. I studied poetry, uh, literature, English literature and Australian literature here at the University of Sydney. And one of my other great loves is my role as chair of the Sydney Writers' Festival. And it's, it's interesting to me uh, that this year, as we were coming out of uh, COVID and we had a window where we could hold events, one of the absolute biggest events um, that we had at the Writers' Festival this year was a poetry re recital, a poetry celebration at the Sydney Town Hall that absolutely packed out the town hall. And I think that's indicative to me of just how, how, how many people connect with poetry, um, how, how frequently poetry is part of people's creative experience, uh, poets they love, poems that they love. And of course, for many people, the creative art of uh, uh, writing poetry themselves. And I think this remarkable prize, how extraordinary, uh, how many people completed these vast volumes of poetry to be able to submit, putting burden on the judges to whom we are grateful. But I am also struck of the judges' uh, assessment that the quality was so great that we have a long short list. And rather than just giving out uh, one prize tonight, we're giving out two prizes tonight. I also think we should just pause before we get down to the business end of the evening uh, to, to uh, have a moment and just talk about um, Helen Ann Bell and her remarkable generosity that underpins Australia's richest poetry prize uh, tonight. She was born in 1947 and she completed a Masters of Arts by coursework at the University of Sydney before taking a postgraduate diploma in adult education. And she worked widely in a number of areas of adult literacy and Aboriginal education. She had a number of poems published in her lifetime, but it was the bequest that she made um, that underpins this award tonight. The bequest award makes a significant future-oriented and necessary investment in Australian arts of culture. And this year, the award offers an increased prize of $40,000 and publication by Vagabond Press for a collection of poems by an Australian woman poet about any topic that deals with Australian culture in some way. Now, um, as we said earlier, I've got to get my paperwork right here. Um, there are two awards uh, tonight, because for the first time tonight, uh, the University of Sydney has decided to award a special uh, award, the School of Literature, Art and Media Poetry Award, the SLAM Poetry Award. And this award is to the value of $8,000 towards publication and recognises the person whose manuscript is determined by the judges to be the runner-up in 2021. And so tonight, I'm de not delighted to announce 
that the winner of this award is Janine Lane for, Gar for Garimara Gathering, a unique work of eloquent resistance and custodianship and witnessing, which offers a poetic path towards healing. Congratulations. Yeah, Mandang Guru. Thank you. Um, Yerudu Maring. Um, I first and foremost like to um, acknowledge the um, Gadigal and Wanigal peoples on whose land I have the privilege of being invited this afternoon and express my thanks for the warm welcome from Auntie Rowena. I would also like to thank and acknowledge um, Wiradjuri peoples, who are my ancestors from southwestern New South Wales on the Murrumbidgee River near Gundagai. Also acknowledging all First Nations pe people here this evening and everyone else gathered. Mandanguru, thank you. It's a um, tremendous honour as a First Nations poet to be shortlisted for the Helen Allen Bell, Al Helen Ann Bell, sorry, bequest. And as a First Nations poet, and all First Nations poets, we are always writing against the grain of a national narrative. Always, always struggling for a space to be heard. And while First Nations poetry has come a long way in terms of the Australian narrative, there's still quite a long way to go. Um, and so um, it is incredibly important to be recognised through the School of Art literature and media this evening and I'd like to say thank you and I'd like to also acknowledge fellow shortlisted poets all other poets who submitted for the award this evening and say a particular thanks to the School of Literature Art and Media for their generosity in recognizing this award thank you Thanks, Janine, and congratulations uh, to you. And, and as we now uh, move on to uh, uh, present the Helen Ann Bell uh, Bequest Award, uh, we'd like to particularly thank the, the judges who did that epic work, Kate Lilly, Pam Brown, and Melinda Bufton, who reviewed this long list of 309 unpublished manuscripts. And they did the hard work, and from that, they created what they described as a stunning short list of seven new poetry manuscripts. But I'm delighted that to be able to announce tonight that the Helen Ann Bell Bequest Award goes to Emily Stewart for Running Times. Congratulations, Emily. Oh, wow. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, as I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people on whose lands we meet and the Wangal people on whose lands I wo worked, walked and lived and loved while writing my manuscript Running Time. I tend to think of myself as a painfully slow writer, um, but the compression and form of running time was shaped by the unique duration of lockdown and the writing came together quickly and intensely over the past few months. Poets are as brave as anything um, for the risks they take in pursuit of self-expression. The work we do values complexity over reductive thought and holds space for the full spectrum of human experience, ambivalence and doubt, as well as pleasure and surprise. I am sure this will ring true in the readings we'll hear later tonight. 
and I feel pr proud and humbled to be included among this incredible group of women. Congratulations to all of you. I'd like to give my thanks to this year's judges, Kate Lilly, Pam Brown, and Melinda Bufton. I'm so grateful for your collect, oh, where am I? I'm so, <laughs> I'm so grateful for your generous attention and your enthusiasm for my writing. It is such a rare honor to experience your collective wisdom, intelligence, and wit as displayed in your wonderful citations. Thank you for reading all of our work so carefully. My mind keeps turning to the number of submissions this year, over 300. This number, it actually gives me a sense of profound hope, showing that we're not alone in our labors. Behind every manuscript is years of sustained effort and development, and that commitment is always a radical act, but never more so than now when writers and artists are reckoning with so much overt hostility from our government and many of our institutions. For many of us, writing isn't a choice so much as it's the quiet engine of our lives. And I want to acknowledge the tremendous efforts of everyone who submitted this year. I'd also like to acknowledge the previous recipients of this award, Pip Smith, Fiona Heil, and Melinda Bufton, three exceptional poets whose work has been so generative for my own thinking and writing over many years. I'd like to thank Beth Yap, Bronwyn Rennix, and the Department of English for administering this award and for the department's enormous contributions over decades in educating, champion, and supporting Australian writers. The collective effort of the work made and imagined by this place has shaped our culture in immeasurable ways. Um, I also want to say that my first book uh, was supported by this department through the Noel Rowe Poetry Award in 2016. Um, so it's quite uh, a moving and special treat to be back here again a few years down the line. Um, I'd like to thank my girlfriend Lucy for being so supportive and cool. <laughs> and of course, I'd like to thank the Helen and Helen and Bell and her family for this generous bequest, which periodically makes visible the extraordinary creative commitment of women across the country. Helen sounds like an absolutely terrific person, and being in correspondence with her now across time is an intangible gift that I will not take for granted. I don't think any poet imagines something like this will happen. <laughs> um, this award has moved the horizon line of what's possible and has given me renewed courage in continuing with my work. Thank you. Welcome back to the Helen Ann Bell Poetry Bequest Award Ceremony, the second half. Uh, um, in which we're so um, honoured and happy to have the, uh, the shortlist and the winners read their work for us and to introduce them um, this evening and to say a few words. Um, we've got our Chair of Department, Hugh Griffiths of the um, Department of English. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Um... Hello, everybody. Um, welcome back. Uh, before I start, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that we're on Gadigal land, unceded Gadigal land, where we're speaking from today. And I acknowledge elders, past, present, and emerging, and all First Nations people present as well. Um, I've been chair of the English department for the last two and a half years. And before I started, I had some fantasy that would be mainly things like this. Um, <laughs> It's been mainly me sitting in my room uh, in the mountains <laughs> in front of a screen. So it's absolutely fantastic uh, to, to welcome you all here today. Um, also to say how proud the English department is to be associated with this prize. Um, it's uh, really important to us. And it's just so nice that our um, welcome back into the world is this prize. Um, I was thinking today about what it means to me to be in the department that I work in, just because I was actually in it for the first time in a, in, in a wee while. Um, and uh, the English department to me is, um, well, it's part of the institution here, but it's more than that. It's more than the sum of its parts. It's more than a collection of academics and students who occasionally meet in a room or a Zoom room and talk about books. Uh, important and fantastic though that is. It's also uh, part of a much bigger community, uh, um, a community um, of uh, people interested in poetry in art and literature, a community of practice. Um, it's a welcoming place, I hope, for people interested in the same things that we're interested in. Um, 
And uh, it's really fitting then that the first person or the first thing that I've got to thank on my uh, quite long list of things that I've got to thank here is, is to thank Vagabond Press, um, who are really important, um, really important to... Um, important to the world of poetry, important to the world of literature, and really important to the Department of English. Um, Michael Brennan uh, started the press in 1999 when he was doing his PhD in the Department of English. So it's only fitting and fantastic that he's still, the press is still here supporting um, uh, this prize uh, by publishing uh, the winning uh, manuscript. So many thanks to Vagabond Price, an extraordinary press. Um, as Kate was saying earlier, it's tough to get poetry published in Australia. It's tough to get public, published poetry published anywhere in the world, but in Australia. Um, and Vagabond Press are now the most kind of long lasting and innovative poetry list. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, it's also uh, my job to thank the judges. Um, I won't introduce them again. They've been introduced a fair amount, but um, this, this, this time um, I'm doling out flowers as well. So um, uh, first, uh, Melinda Bustle. Um, uh, I remember two years ago listening to Melinda Reed um, uh, at, at the, the last one of these events and being absolutely blown away. So thank you for uh, taking part this year. Um, thanks also, of course, to Pam Brown, who um, in this company needs absolutely no introduction, but does uh, need some flowers. <laughs> And also, of course, um, Associate Professor Kate Lilly, who every time I meet her these days, I'm giving flowers to. <laughs> Which is no more than she deserves. Um, also, like very much to thank the staff at uh, University of Sydney behind the scenes working so hard to make uh, this award uh, take place. In particular, Tiffany Britton, who I see at the back there. Thank you, Tiffany, as uh, wonderful as ever at breakneck speed getting this going. Bronwyn, thank you very much administering this, this whole thing. It's just been fantastic. Um, uh, I don't know how you managed to run it so smoothly, but it's just been fantastic. Uh, for, uh, people on the staff who've promoted uh, this prize and generated through that promotion the huge amount of um, uh, submissions that we got. So uh, Christian Hogg, Grace Hall and Alyssa Blake from marketing. And of course the Chow Chuck Wing um, staff and uh, for uh, letting us use this very fancy location. It's been uh, really nice uh, to be here. Um, there's one person missing from this um, thing that I was given. Um, I don't see Beth's name down here. So, um, <laughs> but of course I would just thank the uh, fantastic Beth Yark for her. Uh, uh, working with Beth in the English department is an extraordinary pleasure. She's uh, incredibly hardworking, incredibly um, dedicated to the work we do in the English department, really dedicated to the work of creative writing. And again, in amongst all that hard work, I, I don't know how you got this together at such breakneck speed, but um, <laughs> Bronwyn and Tiffany's help. But thanks, Beth. Thank you. And I, of course, want to thank the poets who submitted and the poets on the shortlist and the winners. As I said at the start, the Department of English isn't just a collection of academics and students. It's part of the community of literature in Sydney. And we also hope that it's a welcoming place and that from now on you feel at home in amongst us, that our bit of the literary world is now your bit of the literary world as well. You're always welcome in the Woolly Building just over there. Um, uh, and I'm going to hand over to Beth now, who's going to introduce the fun bit of the evening, which is uh, to introduce some readings from our poets. Thanks, Beth. Well, 
Well, I'm, I'm just going to call up the poets actually in alphabetical order. Um, uh, with, uh, I'll, I'll call you up to read because we're waiting to hear this <laughs> all evening. Um, first of all, um, Michelle. Michelle Kale will be reading from Dark. Thanks everyone. And I just wanna say what a, what a delight and pleasure it is to be here. And I'm so grateful to be on the shortlist and honored to be with these in, the, in such great company and thankful to the judges um, whose work I admire very much. And yeah, thank you. Elegia, and this poem starts with um, an epigraph um, from a poem by Emma Jones. It's called Waking, and it's about her mother giving birth. We just rolled from each other like indecent genies, Emma Jones. Insensible to your screams announcing my arrival, I careened from darkness, stretching your cervix, a word meaning neck which gynecologists have split, suctioned or sutured for more than a century. This morning, I woke bereft, a casualty in memory's shrine. Your question probed, haunting the patient skies. Will you come back tomorrow? The autumn day bristled, the hyacinths spilling their heady scent. Inside you, mother, I was called, curved like an asymptote, not madness, nor a matryoshka, but as you lay crumpled in that coffin with folded paper boats and rosary, I died. I once bought red glass beads from Paris, but blue plastic is practical, a sister's choice. Grandchildren reinvent you, colouring in templates, but you authored us all from village to metropolis, carrying the humility that history must forget a rare bouquet of refugee chromosomes and minor heritage. I wanted to keep a rose petal to drown in the lily's musk, slipped my hand into that understory from Sala de Visita to Terrace, Bombay of the Raj, 1880 Portuguese Goa, trimming the halwa with silver, abiding the insufferable heat, the garish notes, vocabularies of silence, slippery nouns, hair slick, skin sweet as droop, in, print, in pitted darkness, deliquescing, the maggots kanji, the worms, Borrowing to the malleus, stapus, incus, your lovely oral bones that cannot hear me. The fall, Tipishina, warm maple leaf, elsewhere it is winter. My father standing at the doorway with a phlegmy cough in the damp basement flat, his gaze of despair, resignation. I fear before the right of knowing. I take the Piccadilly line after Singapore transit, chains at Leicester Square to come back to this room outside time. Some days for no reason I shed tears. Some things cannot be reconciled. How do we heal them? Already in his prime, my father is falling and I fall with him. The kind of man who does not dwell in detail, surely that is greatness to know when the end has come. Forget the taunts, the color of your skin, the sticks and stones. He laughs. I have spent my entire life catching up to history. It was never my favorite subject. We are falling out of the center of the world into oblivion. My mother stands by the window distracted. Clouds are skimming, leaves are spiraling down from the plane trees. She does not notice beauty, though it notices her. And I am the dreamer, I cannot bear her pain or his. 
conceding rather the price paid for dreams. Now I wake to blackness, that punched out hole in the ground. Rehearse the law of physics, I'll answer when gravity calls. Sorry, these are quite depressing. I should have chosen the funny ones. There are some in there. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, sorry. I'll just go and read one more poem now. And thanks again, everyone, for um, being here and celebrating. And congratulations, Emily and Janine. Such a pleasure to, to be here with you and to celebrate with you. I'll just go to the last one, I think. Blaze, it is hard to imagine how desolate the sea, Mars on the horizon, a fickle half moon. The Karawong's arc rending the day with a shrill song, a sweet and lonely song. At least this morning, the sun is bandaged, blistering through the skies, burnt melaleuca, king's coat mallee, sugar gum and wattle. Winter's dead stalks became springtime veins, shivering watertight in the wind, which has its way all over. So what about choosing? To the east and west of Vivon Bay, the dunes are a crematorium, skeletal vestiges of a charred isthmus of French bays, English rivers, pony club, slaughterhouse, rock shelves where seal pups were dragged, clubbed, salted and skinned from 1803. Bloodlines mingle, so the smaller, finer wallabies know instinctively not to trust, despite vegetable peelings I offer. They eat nettles, watching me through the kitchen window. I've read about how some women drowned, trying to escape the stigma of names like Emma, Puss, and polecat, how the emu vanished, possums were sold for rum, tobacco, salt, silver, eucalyptus grease, and the tons of yakka gum it took to make explosives. Fire taught me to abandon everything. When fire comes, shelter on a whalebone, lay by a river, wither, in a shepherd's grave. That is history, to learn I am nothing, to put the darkness back where it belongs, to wet my tongue with rain, to swallow the past as one nourished, to stay wherever the wind should scatter. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Um, and I'd like to invite Joan Fleming up um, to read next. <clears throat> it's such a true honor, thank you. Um, so as you've heard, the poems in this manuscript um, are a result of collaborations with Walpuri families from European Yundamu, and I'm indebted to those um, lifelong and ongoing relationships. Uh, in particular, I wish that my Pimidi Alice and Muduna Christine could be here tonight. <clears throat> Can you hear me okay? Yeah? So, <clears throat> Ethnographers and anthropologists have been inventing the Walpri people for a long time. And uh, the poems in Dirt uh, write back to this problematic history. And they also speak to 
um, the difficulty and impossibility of all that I, you know, can't understand and know. So in this first poem, you'll hear a series of names, Dinny, Hitler, Harry, Bullfrog. These are, um, um, these are names that a few of the sort of big deal Walpri men were christened with in both senses of the word in the early days of Yundamu. So that's it for context, now I'm gonna read. <clears throat> so trigger questions. As a child, my descriptions enjoyed reckless partiality. I didn't know blood was a paste. My teeth fell out and I was gifted money. I learned to believe in Walpri as they lined the family hallway in picture frames. I was sent home with pox and trigger questions. What kind of a creature am I? I am the fat white bulb of the ghost moth. I never enjoyed the scrambled taste. As a child, I suffered the standard contagions. In bed, I made my home report on the Australian insect. How do I live? What are my phases? I slept in a bed of generous and unearned proportions. I gave myself the sailing feeling. I recovered from a picture story of an emu who ends her own children with a rock. Their bodies lined the family hallway in frames. Ritual is a concentric circle, Dinny, Hitler, Harry, Bullfrog. I knew some of their white names. I touched the dots till they rasped. Then I went and watched television. I practiced my routines in the living room. I could be a darling of the world of white actors. When my teeth fell out, I woke up with money. I didn't know blood was a paste. Witchetty grubs live in a burrow of their own creation. I recovered somewhat, I returned to my learning, still a child creature, reading the pictures, now constructing world as a mesh that lets paste through. So the next poem is called, um, this is the last one I'll read. A History of the Tanamite People. Each line is numbered in a sort of purposeful disorder, but I, I'm not gonna read the numbers out, but just keep that in mind. So, A History of the Tanamite People. Rain is irregular, and thus the Tanamite people mapped their thought lives by water sources. They invented no word for color, only color words. Thus, blue and sky is double water, water, water. Thirst is historical. Before the pipeline and after the pipeline, work. The Tanamite people are credited with the invention of the constant request as work. Sometimes the water is only underground. This became a much repeated fact of the Tanamite people. The use of a white pen to render such histories necessitates black paper. Marks stayed on the faces of the Tanamite people. One night there was a windfall late by several centuries. The divisive windfalls are legendary among the Tanamite people. Figure one, an entanglement. Possibly because of the piping in of the fizzy drink. Might, maybe, possibly, and perhaps are thoughts entirely strange to the necessities of a thirst culture. The hot stretches of the day, the short phantasms of the night, 
the Tanamite people touched all plants with their feet. If you think you understand thought maps, if you think you understand how a man sends his penis underground to reach a number of distant women. The Tanamite people went to rest in trees, clever men went to rest in the best trees. Televisions on pension days and Toyotas on royalty days. If you think you understand thirst. Researchers continue to be confounded by their survival mechanisms. Figures in the sorry camps at dawn. Figures in the rock caves following the children home at dawn. The Tanamite people converse with sites in a manner researchers are anxious to observe. The pipelines continue to rupture and continue to be repaired and other such thimble falls. Unrecorded feats of loaves and fishes evade the observations of the researchers. Muscle hard as rock on the right side of the body of the Tanamite people. If you think you understand digging, if you think you understand black paper, the U shape can be plural. Figure two, a refusal. They pulled bones out of their parts, parched skins. They ground their skins pale with a hankering practice, both cunning and confused. Shapes etched in caves depict the coming thirst and the thirst historical. One such figure has a huge mouth and a throat like a needle. Dark lakes bloomed in hazy country like a bad watercolor. Quote, never give a man a drink without taking one of his countries. Surely you have heard this proverb arising from the history of the Tanamite people. Histories such as this are to be mistrusted. Thank you. Um, our next reader is Claire Miranda Roberts, who will be reading to us um, on Zoom. Thank you so much, Kate, Pam, and Melinda for shortlisting me. Can you hear me? So strange. <laughs> And uh, congratulations, Emily. I'm going to read five short fragment poems and three sonnet length poems. And if there's time, maybe a longer poem. So. First, the fragment poems. Banksia, Groundsel, Nocturne, Reflection, and Bass Strait. Banksia. I look out at the crowded yellow candles, slow procession of pink and golden cobs that float and puff coarse nets around linear stems, bear a talent for frost and long absences. Groundsel. Waiting is vaporish. I watch the yellow velvet groundsel looming like a nest of wasps. I might be wrong, but the air seems anxious. A drip of sun could, sit, could tip the whole scene over. This air and the wasps that gather. Nocturne. I wait to return, where, where Gaultheria hispida is tied in coarse bunches while still in the earth. 
Their rouge centers, small hippodromes for the senses that fall asleep at night. Reflection. A longing for place is my only longing. I tell the double narcissus it's inherited yellow. Dark yellow doesn't suit me. It could be weeds or another miracle to forgive. Before human attention shadows these small doorways, I make half peace with the light. And bass straight. The flexibility of lights weft through waves, controls tension until it bends and neither fades nor vanishes radiance. And the sonnet length poems are uh, Waterflower, Wintercento, Euphorbia Milii, or Crown of Thorns. If I can find it, here it is. Waterflower. The lotus blooms triple bending into surface. I want to hide the waterflower to prevent it from being seen, the experience of being defamed or written too clearly. Secrecy belongs to the lotus that unfastens soundlessly, like the falling weights in an elevator contains solitude, a dwelling and a gallery for softened ivory. Wintercento. Look to the stem, see where it tapers, where leaves and flowers emerge. Look to the margins, their attachment to the stem, the arrangement of the leaves, their color, the color of light, light from a secondary source, lighter than deep snow. Snow on the leaf defines the half flowers. Their many silver and gray veins vary the hue and tone of form, leaf buds on trees in winter. And Euphorbia milii, or crown of thorns. What the victim says is always true. The single most important proposition in authorship. What it means to say a proposition reaches exegesis, divides the page in accordance with its own predilections, specifically issues of history and intervention in time, rise out of the narrow stone, stonework as a detail. The patterns find a place not in the center, but at the edges of composition. The fragment read in line with intersecting verses executes its purpose in an, in an inaugural simile. Its contrast dark and comely yields that mixture of rebellion and sweetness, the voice of the thorn. And finally, one long poem. Let's find it. Okay, our iris. Whoever feels addressed by the iris is like the iris. The iris represents a double space that is empty. The iris suggests a figure leaning against the wall. Look at what I did, the iris says. Look at what you didn't see. Look at what you didn't do. But this is a series of substitutions that lead nowhere. Discussing the iris and the iris image like they are perfect reflections for one another, yet seduced by their similitude. I don't dispute the triad or the state of being three, but imagining the beard of falls are a form of expression, ignores the uncertainty 
of not having a self to reflect upon. Our attention has been given to the rose with its supine unveiling, but the iris has never been captured in a perfume. Perfumers use several artificial scents to replicate its wet cotton, nodes of iron and the final nose best described as the purest shade of water. The iris is born and the iris is deserted, but permits us its resources at its most vulnerable. We can only provide the care a witness can offer. Domestic iris, original iris without a hand to grasp us with. Toneless iris on a stalk that resembles lightning. In a murderous desire and desire for the flood, ornament becomes a technology, a tool. I enter the realm of fantasy, growing in profusion on heraldic mountains. If I repeat the experience of failing to become an inanimate thing, suffering in my feeling, rather than being a mere object, the iris evokes a woman. I will finally garner the flower from its sleep, the possibility of being truly awake and the full potential to appear and disappear at will, like the common kingfisher blinds the stream. Thank you. Hello, um, this is quite odd. Um, okay, so I'm going to read, I hope you can all hear me. Um, cool. I'm going to read uh, two poems um, and I could have read, I guess, some really like charged important ones but instead I chose a really fun one. And then the first one I'm reading is narrated by my dog who's sitting on the couch next to me. So yeah, this first one is called Instinct. Midwinter is the season for sunning, your teeth shining blue from the charcoal. A pair of swans are not in love, but in song winging. Push out the curtain. The carpet is puddling. A pair of shoes, not matching, but matching in flare. Lonely suns, lakes of silver. I will pick up that fiddle you left. Inside it, my toy grasshopper, which you thought morbid and I fun. In time, you'd agree. A pair of swans are not in love, but in song winging. You're starting to remember. You write best with a cold nose. With no spare knit or sock to pull onto your hands, you begin tapping, tapping, tapping. Sunlight need not be summer or shimmering or simmered. It need only rub sore this red skin, not burn, you understand. Alan is within the guts of your last camera. And you, my owner, are dizzy with reprisals. Write songs on the trumpet you promised Tommy or dad's beloved classical guitar. Brush your biro teeth on the strings of your epiphany. Bask the taupe midday, it's the season for it. Air grained like timber with youth, cold tap makes you shudder. A pair of swans are not in love, but in song, winging. Run brash ice on charcoal to rinse ink from your teeth, shining your teeth grey in your mouth. Okay, and the, the second poem that I'm going to read um, uh, was first published in the Moth magazine, I have to acknowledge. Um, 
and yeah it's based on a true story it's called a perfect start to the weekend kicking open eyelids after taking quetiapine is as remarkable a feat as sneaking into budapest i'm awake now you're at complex event seemingly for tutankhamun the city's sun there watered splashes over nearby clouds muddying them into silk the sun there is the moon here on the mountain kicking open budapest tut awake now sneaks a street photo fills the canisters with quetiapine after taking a remarkable feat a posting from a cafe window i first met tut in 2000 and something in the gift shop he'd arrived early for the show and was looking for coffee i recommended the green tea but thinking back coffee's better after all it does the kicking for you given his open left thigh he'd never really traveled before he died me neither we bonded over pixar films their specific green and the many snorty faces of the 1970s mustang it's probable you've passed the window from which he took the paper only worked there a while always moves on he'd tell you he can't hack the little habits everyone has but it's not the truth could easily sneak shut his eyelids neath familiar nearby clouds and stamp the same mud into his darkened showroom, venture to the gift shop, looking for coffee, make not a murmur. But he's tied to the circus, doesn't even own the bones. If you leave Budapest by road, you'll see the truck, kneeling on the shoulder, track rod sheared, roll up smoke shirking the sun, a silk buttoned ringmaster covered in phlegm, crying a little bit, emotionally multitasking his highway's edge piss. There is an absurdity to borders, an oddity to being somewhere else suddenly. For you, a remarkable step into the street. For me, it's palatable so long as I'm not about to die and at the same time so long as the new places are as bloody and as damned as the old. I think aeroplanes are shitty and wouldn't say no to six months open ocean rough fucking half-bellied sailors all the way to Seppel. I'd write privileged verse on desolation, pair it with Lynn Schober and Jackie Levin, swallow the inevitable. That's an aside. In reality, you're in Budapest, shaking me awake. Now is the time for a street photo. You're at complex event to see Tut. I'm assuming a lover dragged you because I don't know what you like. At complex event, by the watery light of my plateau's moon, you sneak fill from a canister. I hope you run from all of this into the streets of Budapest, even just out of my mind, because this has been fun, but quetiapine always wins. Uh, thank you for having me. And congrats to everyone. Next, we have Ellis Gilbeck Porter. Hi, um, thank you everyone. It's an honor to be here and to be shortlisted for this wonderful award. Uh, and congratulations as well to Emily and Janine and all the other shortlisted poets. Um, it's wonderful to hear everyone's work here as well tonight. So I'll be reading some poems uh, from the second half of my collection, which is titled uh, Concrete Pool. And this is a long visual sequence. And I'll be reading the text component of some of these poems. Do all swims resemble other swims? And when is repetition not original? Decompression makes lapis lazuli. Here. Tear the frame a little. The blue is waking me up. Notation, 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 notation. You swim into the edges, feigning lack of agility. Rounded corners. The peripheral dimension of word, lying over case. Unconscious drift formation oceanic feeling. 
pressing water one morning, you wake with weather in your shoulder, counting and making life decisions that are not made, but slowly seep. Everyday figure of the unknown, or is it the everyday that sits on your shoulder? Watching the throw of coins, movement of clouds, discerning shapes, a distinct emergence of a telling submerged phase. The joy of being lost in a straight line, dark glum overcast. The pool does not reflect the color as the sea does, but remains bright blue glimmer. Not always terrestrial, these thoughts harbor incipients and disappear. Va et vion, come and go. No attempt to hold the edges, slipping the stream, erodes an echo. Writing always after. Thought of transport, thought of all you can hold at water's edge. Resonance you bring, the always difference. Notional, national, notional, national. Zeroing in on the lead, zeroing in on the layers of water, slow. And what layer are you swimming on? Agnes drawing line after line on walls and in sand in the desert plains. It would take around four hours of straight swimming to replicate a grid painting. This night and bright moon, Martin's grid, a body holds, moves all, water is the sight. I am now amorphous, watch me. People love bodies, sleek bodies, bold bodies. Dicey waters or nearest offer, more straight lane Agnes Martin, repetitive grid. Underwater, tiding under weather. For a spell, are you skint? Joy still propels, kicks fear. Currency in laps and fit, rehash, tar, and see diacritic waters sliced obediently. Propagation of light, skimming surfaces, and uh, skimming surfaces, swimmingly or not swimmingly, automatism strains streak. You are a spell for water under weather, tiding. Sun blind, quiet lines. Well, here for ripple effect. A late sun reflects scatter. New motion, nothing new. Chain mail light. Forum on trained rectangular prism. Metronome, match watch. To my tepid layer held close. 27 degrees, 9.36 AM. They ink peripatetic slow lengths. Graduated sky, voluminous perimeter, cherry clouds getting on, time lapsing lengths, shimmer sheet, returning lengths, slow tide under armor. Thank you. Janine Lane, next. You're too marrying and um, and then Guru. Again. <clears throat> Um, 
Yeah, I'll say again, First Nations poets are all of us writing against a national narrative. And while we've come a long way, there's still a lot more space that we need. Um, <clears throat> the first poem I'm going to read is called White Trinity of Genocide, which is actually a visual poem. So I'm going to do is read you the citation. And this poem grew out of an exhibition of 20 artists at a Murray Art Gallery, Aubrey, Mama, Mama Murray Art Museum, Aubrey. Last year, um, this gallery is probably one of the unsung spaces that really celebrates First Nations people well and without having to be prompted. Um, and they put together an exhibition last year of 20 artists reflecting on 2020, the year that had been. And I was a commissioned poet and I had the pleasure of responding to Gamurai artist Archie Moore's work. And uh, Archie Moore reconstructed a stained glass window of black Jesus <clears throat> and a corona crown which to remind people that as First Nations people, we are always living under a crown. It was probably the first time that a lot of you were living under any crown last year, but we have always been living under a crown or at least one or other. So three C's that kill blackness. I was reflecting on the C words that Archie's work interrogated and organize them in a crucifix cross in the order that they occur was capitalism, colonialism, and Christianity. And capitalism uh, uh, that gives rise to a mode of production that steals land, which is colonialism, and Christianity being the philosophy that justifies all of this land grab. And my citation for this poem. So I arranged those three words in a shape of a crucifix with black genocide in the middle. <clears throat> the citation to the poem is a direct quote from the Bible. And my citation is called Deuteronomy is Genocide. It's a direct quote from the Old Testament changed only by the uh, names of Aboriginal peoples that I've added instead of the Jewish tribes that they were speaking of exterminating at the time. So I begin, Deuteronomy is genocide. This is not God's country or not God's own country. When your Lord God brings you into the countries you are invading to steal and massacre and dispossess many nations, the Darug, Gadigal, Wiradjuri, Gamilaroi, the Kulin Nations, Ulukuri, Murray, Nanga, Nunga, Yalni, and Palawa peoples, all the hundreds of Aboriginal nations and cultures older and deeper than you. And when your God has commanded you to massacre and dispossess the country's first people, you must make no treaty with the survivors or their descendants and show them no mercy. The resonance of that is a little scary. And I remind you that you are living on stolen lands. The next piece I want to read is called Mirul Baniye Gurian. Mirul is clay. Badir is stone, Gyrn is charcoal, ash. Nia Wiradjuri, Narangang, sacred country, Dagan, earth, ash, dust, soil, plunge me deep, Nikara, into your mural veins of Guliang, story. Let your ochres draw Nagal from me, my country's own words, 
Hinabang words, Paru Wajri, Paru Duri Madiliana, Paru Ninghai, Binhara, make young, cleanse me from colonial silence, kindle hot cinders, etch memories into my Gahara. Inkuring, charcoal, immoral, clay. And this one's called Stepping Right Into the Moment. Now I was asked to, by a First Nations poet to write a poem that paid attention to the moment. So this one's called Fortress Australia in pandemic 2021. Last night I watched the sun eclipse the moon in the night sky and between them earth no longer as we know it, love child of star-crossed planets. Australia devours itself, slice by slice like stale white bread, a cannibal of states and territories, nobody's celebration of a nation, a loose weave of a federation says, fuck this union, Jack. This mate ship has sailed. No more boats. Colonies are revolting. When identity politics explodes, implodes in viral pandemic, soft borders harden in Queensland hospitals are for Queenslanders only. And New South Wales has got goal contact tracing standards and doesn't need and need to shut down. And WA says who needs the eastern seaboard and SA boasts their virus free. Tasmania is an island nation and Victoria is severed like a leper's limb and no time for Samaritanism. Not all states shine equal in that Southern Cross. And a woman is raped in a parliament house under a hill's hoist flag lawmen of the highest order can't remember who irons their shirts. Between private school privilege and bowls of prawns, the world is not everyone's oyster. The milkshake of consent thrown back in another's face, it takes a wealthy white woman to get assaulted before people listen. PM's wife says, think about your daughters, could be them. Well, how good is Australia? PM sleeps smugly under a doona of delusion. His wife doesn't ask him to think about brown children. They could never be his daughters. He can decide who comes here. This is a fortress. A hairdresser on a Gold Coast gives health advice on anti-vaccination. Elderly are malnourished. More politicians and athletes are immunised than the vulnerable. So what dystopia are we talking about now? Black lives still don't matter. Supporters are labelled statue-busting anarchists. Women are still not being heard. Social justice, justice activists are radical Marxist. Wokeness and political correctness cause white genocide anxiety. It's everyone for themselves. Citizens are locked in. Asylum seekers are locked out. Loneliness breeds totalitarianism. Last night, I watched the sun eclipse the moon in the night sky between them, Fortress Australia. This one, the short one, is for Arnie Carey Reed Gilbert, who was the great unsung hero, or one of the great unsung heroes. Uh, there are far too many and far too many people who, like Arnie Carey, uh, wait till, till they're dead before their book is published. So this is for Arnie Carey Reed Gilbert, who I had the pleasure of also living in the same neighbourhood with. I think I might see you when I walk out this morning along the street we used to share. Winter is cold in Canberra. Icy winds off the mountains, sleeting rains, sun-fired fogs that hang low and late and bring down the birds in, in the, <clears throat> sorry, 
bring birds down into the hollow where the suburbs are now. They come in droves, rainbow lorikeets, mountain lowries, crimson rosellas, galahs, gangangs, sulphur-crested karaku, your totem. And it was not meant to be, and I turn the corner and the wind hits me cold and sharp in the face like the reality. You are not here. And it has been three seasons since you weathered in this house with a jasmine-clad front fence, lilies by the front door and poetry strewn across your floor. And early on the morning of your passing, a thick cloud of kawaku swept in, flying low above your old house, calling loud and releasing all that was unsung of you across the open sky. And the last one, Narambangyali, which uh, <clears throat> should be my birthright to speak Wiradjuri, but it wasn't. So now I have to go back and learn it like a child that should have always had that right. Country speaks, it's been too long since I sat on granite in my country and thought, too many years since I breathed this air, Briang, Nyang, Gana, felt this dirt, Nagamanding, Dagang, smelt this dust, Bara, Ni, Banang. Listen for the sounds of her words that say, Banda, Dahuai, Bamol, Maria, Ni, one boy. Abiyon, Yabiyon. History does not have the first claim, nor the last word. Ninihai, Yara, Daharabul, Ninihai, Gingu. You can speak us now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Janine Lane, um, who um, is the winner tonight of the SLAM Poetry Award 2021. And finally, I'd like to invite Emily Stewart, who is the winner of the Helen Ann Bell Poetry Bequest Award. Thanks for that awesome reading, Janine. It was wonderful. Um, and to everyone hearing you, um, yeah, it's quite bizarre. This is sort of the first outing back, um, back kind of with others in public. And I, yeah. Um, all right. So uh, what I'm reading is um, the, the poems in my book are kind of, uh, they're untitled and they're kind of episodic. They've got that kind of film scene kind of quality uh, to them. And in the book, they're in four untitled sections and I've kind of truncated them together to give a bit of an arc of the book. Um, yeah, and the other thing to know, I guess, is that maybe the kind of, uh, uh, there's a sort of performative eye persona that runs through all of them. Um, all right. Every summer I doom scroll, every autumn I sigh and sigh at the new pool I dive into my cerebral offcuts. The brain filled with shame cannot learn, sluggish until touched. Old time ago, troublingly sticky, I was hiding my seriousness and glitched. Oh frightening, oh chalice, who's okay am I seeking out this financial year? I write and I say, take it easy, please, Alda. I walk, sometimes I run. Some of us like to take a subtler position, using compliments to force attention, stop me about anything. My garden is a work site. I slowly realize the light is artificial as afternoon fades the stray at my door. How lean, lively, linear. The interior is slapped together. Waddle sees an outlier in a vase. Plates need washing, bare walls, handwritten note, blue tacked. Notionally, it's a scene anyone can draw. Rough notes that phalanx in company, the love thing is thinking. 
If you were cute, I was signposted, raising my hand. My elsewhere might be a cold column dicing the afternoon or what's around, inner in outer. The present was forever lowing inside, inside the room, waiting for your voice on the phone. Guess what, idiot? Form ply, it's not nothing knowing what I have. I'm dead from this lack of tenderness. None of this is easy. I'm trying to get in front of the story. Whoa, 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 let's gather our inner resources. Who was the sickest prince that year? Here was some new genre of kid. Phone turns woof to woof. Anybody else? How major is it? How major is getting a tooth removed, red herring? I'm clapping back, learning to drive, a sudden recovery of optimism. Certain things must be understood over and over. Forgive me my ethic and my intensity. Toyota Echo intrusive image and old vernacular where I spent too much time. The counselor is wearing all black flummoxed, ruffling my circumspection, asking my opinion, read the real work wives of publishing. I fall asleep, my interest having waned. I'm bleeding from the nose, a common malady. She quips, she rolls her eyes, she moans softly, she mimics slicing her own throat. Pass me another handful of sea slugs. By the way, I am here in particular sounding the alarm at the council of the municipality of Ashfield, installing a big salmon. Oh, chime in, thank whoever you see first. This dream is environmental. So many competing tendencies and power lines. I'm getting back to the thing I'm not doing. Your camera is on, stressed out, glossy light. Spiraling outside, feeling fine, getting back to throwing a stone, browsing privately, dawdling a pebbled seam to its great. I'm no longer planning a holiday, the impulse trickling. Give me your address again and the trashiest flowers, roses. Dear petitioner, strawberries so mercantile, rinse first. This isn't bot speak, it's me talking. I'm um, about our lighthearted relationship. Am I not the gender you asked for? Am I a bad bunny, psychosynthetic? She looks up at me with her headache. This is a courtesy given everything going on. The air of a, mm, a real tease on feeling type. Of course, the details matter. All those first names I call myself, temperamentally yours, X. Well, right now I'm listening to Susan Sogtag's The Volcano Lover on audiobook. I'm not stagnating at all. I am combusting, flambe. Add me to your permanent psycho registry. May I speak plainly? Last decade was terrible. Nothing decorative, nothing figurative. Just bolsa, 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 wood. Lime sun, a piece of flashing tile. What do you think about giving some control back, moving along with a smile on my face? Positive ions, I tend towards listing showy concepts. The brain's reward center, the wrong thing, the light inadmissible, up-tempo, up-river, the balcony, the gutters, orientation, the somniloquy. Show the mark, the sticker on the apple, the full archetype, the public art frisbee, rushing towards seclusion. It's true that your edge will singe. I've been working king tide hours maximizing and from the bus window I see you loafing, walking past King Hot Bread. I'm in the wrong disguise as, as, as a parent. Pistachio, I say, before they ask, great star of my theme. Perhaps the benefits are too hard won, throwing my phone across the room. Who is Santa? What is his sexuality? A Californian poppy, catch my enthusiasm. Every other animal is perfectly handsome. Lots of neighbourhood in this trouble. I'm just at home listening to Snake Farm. I'll find a job tomorrow afternoon. My personal strengths and what this economy will pay for, I'm on antibiotics, are not the same thing. Today I avoid catastrophe, burning through quick sums, dreaming of lava flows and sizzling, volume up. Does math help truly figure it? The calendar week restarting. A grassy corner of light, a partly real place with an imagined underground, I imagine it, and the middle hours, writing standing up, dolphin coffee table, leaping back to the other hemisphere, this is a child's wish I won't let go. Shuffling cards, hoping for a dare, kids love animals first and learn their ways. I know where I'm going wrong, flicking between screens. My mood is split and my meaning, filling up the boot, a hand in the pocket of last year's jeans or the jeans of the year before. 
It's been a while since I felt a baseline vibrate. Where's the community chest? Crowd gathering to look at sleeping owls. The weather is true enough, don't probe. Those places I can't look where a surge is felt. I'm in luck, not in love. Greedy for more heat, absently stroking the microchip. The stars blister above me all the way to central. Looking for something, there's a spike on every page, what we expect. Is that posture mine? Looking closely at the sigil, a floodlight comes on, a curtain is swishing behind the intoxicated front lawn. This time I'm an animal, sleuthing among offspring, jumping over and over the same fence. The curtains are twill, semi-transparent, wrecked at the hems. Doubt is more private than shame, which is worn on the body. My fantasy is that crisis is revelatory, that change is a process I can trip the wire on. Is it hard enough I am trying? My mood, mode is mood, but you can't. I bring home epoxy filler, truncate an atmosphere. So hard and so sorry, candle in an alcove, signing in from whenever, always waiting a few moments to start. Arg. I am in a ground floor turret, the shape of a mood, held together by a dream that can't withstand my focus. A nice idea to let in some temperature, the sultriest playlist, sonic flex repeating a while. Where are my ideals? All these stacked books represent such need. My particular difficulty, I can't admit I'm free, not thwarted. Use it or lose it. The libido is surfeit, self-generating, habits of force fields. What I mean feels concussive, invective as in imagined. This is not an avenue I've wandered down before. Look out for me, biting my thumb, asking the same of you. Seen, a dewy cosmopolitan mastiff, the fresh sign of my thinking. Optimistic, I don't believe so. Here's what puts me to sleep, wriggling out of a bad feeling. Another gaff, it's fear leading the posse while a leaf unfurls. All those boys in the wrong, missing an enzyme between the cut and paste. That last part is an indictment, walking after daylight, traffic rising like a natural feat, location, sensation, emotional. So I demand to be remade much warmer than I feel. Break the rules today, I keep stumbling prose, anticipating a total detour. Something colossal needs striking out with our wit, we can point name index and leave, but where to? The building called Oceanic out near Mascot. Unfortunately, I tear it in half. What novelties gleam, sense it at the day spa, mineral water, a startlingly popular leitmotif. We float and it continues, the group wants their barbarity known, agglomeration of idle matters, the more major, the more insipid, disturbing the neighbours, let's switch places, the neighbours must be disturbed, falling backwards into the trust exercise, following some line. Collegial congrats, having gone abstract, you turn up against my thigh, crash the site. There will be a day left at the other end to intuit. Thank you. That brings the formal part of our evening to a close. Um, I just want to thank all of the poets who read so beautifully, um, work that was so moving and powerful and delightful and funny, um, but that put us into a, a different space in which to think about the world, our world. Um, and for me also, all of the things that we need to do. <laughs> um, so just some final um, thanks, Bill, on, uh, Bill who's gone, <laughs> who helped us with the ICT. Uh, Felicity, Felicity and Arabella from Chow Chow Wing, who really help us to put all of this together. Um, and also, I, I should acknowledge that the photographs of the beautiful jacarandas around Sydney University were all taken by Bronwyn. Um, <laughs> um, thank you to everyone who is here and has spent this beautiful evening with us. Um, it's so wonderful to see you all here in person and also um, live streamed uh, on Zoom. Um, and, and, you know, for our, our two poets who couldn't be here, you know, it's so wonderful to see you in this way as well. Um, and with that, I'll just um, say thank you and good night. Um, there's more drinks, I think, and outside. 10 minutes, yeah. <laughs> so 
we can go out and refresh ourselves. Thank you very much. Sorry, oh damn. <laughs> You are amazing. Oh, I'm happy to be of help. What was I doing? I was just cleaning up. Sorry. <laughs>